I don't know. It, yeah, it's days like this that test your commitment to a fashion strategy. Um, <laughs> You never knew this was a fashion strategy, right? <laughs> it's not. So, Hey, if we have not yet met, uh, my name is Bill Rector, and I am delighted to be the teaching pastor here at Highland Country Fellowship. And we are delighted that you braved the wind and cold weather to be out here with us today. Thank you for coming. Uh, worship is really an attitude that you have. Two people could be in the same service and one will leave thinking, I didn't like the song, and the other is just because of the attitude of thankfulness, putting God first. Everything we do all week long can be done unto the Lord. Amen? And so it is fun. I hope you are worshiping all week long, brothers and sisters, but it's really fun when we get together and worship together. There's something very special about it, and I thank you for, for giving us this time. And it's time for us to open God's Word, which is what we do every weekend. We go verse by verse through the Bible. Slowly, and uh, we finished chapter 15 last week. I know you guys don't really want to believe that, but and so we're going to start into chapter 16 uh, this week and go verse by verse through it into a very interesting parable. So if you if you have your Bibles, open them with me. Uh, if not, I think we may have it up on the screen, and if not, then you just listen, okay? And this is Luke chapter 16. Beginning in verse 1, Jesus told his disciples, there was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. So he called him in and asked him, what is this I hear about you? Give an account of your management because you cannot be manager any longer. The manager said to himself, what shall I do now? My master is taking away my job. I'm not strong enough to dig and I'm ashamed to beg. I know what I'll do. So that when I lose my job here, people will welcome me into their houses. So he called in each one of his master's debtors. He asked the first, how much do you owe my master? 800 gallons of olive oil, he replied. The manager told him, take your bill, sit down quickly and make it 400. Then he asked the second, and how much do you owe? A thousand bushels of wheat, he replied. He told him, take your bill and make it 800. The master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of the light. I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves so that when it is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. And this, beloved, is the word of the Lord, and the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. Now, this is one of the most interesting parables to me in the whole Bible. And some people have a lot of trouble with it. A part of it is because we're, this is a dishonest manager. And, and in case you think that there's a lot of people who want to spin this in some way or another where he's not acting dishonestly, no, in verse 8, Jesus calls him dishonest. So this is the title of my sermon today. I hope will help you understand this. This is a, a good lesson from a bad example. And I don't know if we've got the title slide, but I want to let you know. this. Oh, there it is. That's good. A good lesson from a bad example. And this is not the first time that Jesus has done this. Occasionally, Jesus will give us bad examples, and he will teach from them. And one of my favorites, let me give you, see if I can give you an example here that, that makes sense here as we kind of warm our way up to this. In, in Matthew chapter 7, beginning in verse 9, one of my favorite stories Jesus tells, listen to it, it says, which one of you, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, I always enjoy that part, Jesus reminding us that we're evil, like we need that. I'm sorry. The, if you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask? And you see, this is almost a ridiculous bad example. I mean, no one would give a hungry child a stone as if it were bread, and no one would give a hungry child a, a, a snake as if it were a fish, right? And so if you know not to do that, how much more will God know how to give you good things? And it's, it's a classic argument, and the rabbis used it a lot. It's called from the lesser 
to the greater. You see that? If, if you know not to do that, don't you think God knows not to do that? And, and that's, that's kind of what we're going to be dealing with today. Now, sometimes these get a little tricky because the lesser example is kind of rotten. There's one we're going to cover here in Luke 18. I don't want to get ahead of myself. I want to wait till next year to cover it. Uh, but <laughs> In Luke 18, there's a widow who something terrible has happened to her, some, some injustice, and we don't know what, and she's seeking justice from a judge. And the judge is rotten. We, we know, he even says that he doesn't fear God or men. Now you think about that for a minute. The two greatest commandments are love the Lord your God. You have this vertical relationship. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then love your neighbors yourself. You can think of it as a vertical and a horizontal, right? I always remind myself of the cross when I think of that. Right? And I think that's interesting. This man, if we are told, fears neither God nor men. So he is rotten, bad rotten, right? And in Luke 18, verse 4, he eventually gives in to this lady just to keep her from nagging him. It says this, for some time he refused. Finally, he said to himself, even though I do not fear God or care about men. It's an interesting thing to say to yourself, isn't it? Yet because of this widow, because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually wear me out with her coming. Now, Jesus is going to use this to make a lesser to a greater argument. It would be really wrong to infer from that, and I hope nobody does, but it would be really wrong to infer from that that Jesus is, is thinking that God gets kind of annoyed with our prayers, but if we repeat them long enough, he'll be so annoyed that just to make us go away, he'll give us what we want. Right? That's, yeah, no, no, that's not what, what this is teaching. Right? I, I, it's okay if you try that, but it is... What he's really saying is, look, if, a, if, an, if an ungodly man will eventually concede to the request, what do you think your Father in heaven, who's an infinitely just and loving being and loves you, will do when you make that request? Do you see the argument from the lesser? If you can see that, then today's parable is very much like that. It really is. What we're seeing is, is a, a bad guy, a rascal here but he's doing something clever. And our job here after reading this parable is to think, you know, if an unethical person can be real clever with the resources that God has given to them in such a way as to gain favor with other people, how much more should God's people be smart, be clever with the resources God has given them to gain favor for the kingdom of heaven? Amen? That's what we're dealing with today. So let's dig in. It begins, verse 1, Jesus told his disciples there was a rich man whose manager accused him of wasting his possessions. Just, we take note a little bit that he's talking to his disciples this time, right? In all of chapter 15, he was talking kind of to or at the Pharisees. Now he's talking to his disciples. So this is for us. This lesson is specifically for us as Christ followers. Right? That's why he's telling this, this parable. The rich man, if you were really wealthy, you would have hired someone to take care of your estate and to manage it. But you'd have to be pretty wealthy before that job would work. And we're going to see later that this guy is pretty, pretty wealthy. Uh, he's accused of wasting. And the word there could be the same as squandering, which is really interesting because that's, that's really what the prodigal son did. He, it's the same word, squandered. And so it's kind of interesting that this comes after that. So this guy wasted his manager's possessions. And I have to point out, we don't know why. When we're dealing with a parable, it's really important for us to investigate the culture around it so we can hear the parable, hear the story, the same way people of that century would have heard it coming out of Jesus' mouth. But we can't invent details because Jesus spoke this. This isn't a real situation. It's a real lesson from a parable. So we can't pour into it more information that we just wish was there. And that's kind of, that's part of the problem here. So we have no idea. It could be because he was skimming off the top. It could be just that he was just a bad manager. He was making bad deals. He was a terrible negotiator. You know, he was being foolish with the research. He was letting some of them rot on the dock and spending too much time worrying about it. It could be that he was just bad. We get a little bit of a clue into that in the second verse, where, where the master calls him in, 
and ask, what is this I hear about you? Give an account of your management because you cannot be manager any longer. Now, you got to be careful because we hear that maybe the way that we would do that. If you've ever had an employee that maybe has had a difficult situation, you might say, look, I, I've heard something bad about the way you're managing this thing that I've delegated to you. I want to sit down with you and I want to have an accounting with you because if you have indeed managed this poorly, you, you can't do that anymore, right? That's the way we might hear it. What, what, what the last sentence here really tells it all, you're fired. <laughs> you're fired. You know, I, I've heard this stuff about you and what he's heard is bad. It's, it's the word diabolos. It's where we, we, get, we get diabolical from that. So I've heard that you are not good at this job. And maybe, maybe I put you into the job too early. I don't know. But you can't do this anymore. So bring me an account of the records so I can get someone else to do it. Do you hear it that way? Because that's really what's going to happen. And we know that because the dishonest manager gets another at least day or so to do this job and meet with the other people. And this is what's interesting. I don't know in the parable, you can infer a lot of stuff. Maybe he was just being just really foolish with the resources. And the manager says, you know, I don't, I don't think I need to like march him immediately out the door. Because you know they do that sometimes in companies when they think you've done something illegal. They frog march you out the door, right? And they sometimes do it so all the rest of the employees can see that. He doesn't do that here. So this guy's left in charge for a little while. And, and he's left in charge until he can say, bring me the books. Let's go through the books together because you're done. I'm going to get someone else to do it. Either way, he's losing his job. The, 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 at the end of verse 3, he says, you can't do this anymore. And that might mean you're just not able. Uh, so he's, he's starting to freak out a little bit because this would have been an honored position. So in verse 3, the manager said to himself, what shall I do now? My master is taking away my job. I'm not strong enough to dig, and I'm ashamed to beg. So you know, there's a couple of things about this. He doesn't really have a plan for the future, and it doesn't look like he saved anything, which would indicate he is a poor manager, right, of his own things, not just the other guys. And, and he's, he's come to the conclusion that without this job, I'm in trouble. Managing these assets, negotiating on behalf of a wealthy person, he would have had status, he would have probably been a free man rather than a servant. See, if he was a servant, then the guy would just say, look, I'm just going to reassign you somewhere. You can feed pigs or something, whatever, right? And he knew he would have been taken care of. He's going to be out on the streets, and that's what he's realizing. And when I'm out on the streets, what are my choices? And they're not good. Manual labor, right? You can always pick up a shovel and do manual labor. There are people that will hire you for a day for a denarius. But he doesn't think he's strong enough to do that. Or he could beg, but he's ashamed. And I think you know, Thomas Constable in his commentary said something really interesting. He says he's too proud to beg, but he's not too proud to steal. Now you think about that for a minute. See, begging is public. It embarrasses you public. Stealing maybe just embarrasses you privately. And he's too proud to beg, but he's not too proud to steal. So he gets an idea in verse 4. I know what I'll do. When I lose my job here, I know what I'll do so that when I lose my job here, people will welcome me into their houses. He has a eureka moment. He's got a plan. And see, what we're to do is to see if we can be at least acknowledged that there's something clever about his plan. Make no mistake, this guy's a rascal. But there's something about his plan that we've got. And it is interesting to me that his plan isn't to take a whole bunch of money and run off to Egypt. Right? He, he, he might have a plan to steal. And, no, what is his goal? It's so that people will welcome him into their houses. That's interesting to me. So he's got a plan so that he will make friends among the community and they will help take care of him. So we're going to have to do this like by at half. Or the first half of verse 5 says, So he called in each one of his master's debtors. We don't know how many there were. We, we, we see him interact with two of them, so we know there's at least two. But given the size of this estate, and we'll get into some of these quantities in a minute, there, there could have been dozens of people. And so he's calling them all in. Each one he's calling in. 
And they are, the debtors means they owe his master something. And that's what he's doing. The second half of verse 5, he asked the first, how much do you owe my master? Now, this made me laugh all week. Can you imagine walking into a bank like Wells Fargo where you have a mortgage and, and them saying to you, them saying to you, how much do you owe us? I, I don't, you know, a um, couple bucks. <laughs> no, it's 20. It's 20, right? I mean, I, it's, that's a silly question. Just think about it that way. Why is he doing that? Well, some suggest that it's further evidence that he's a buffoon. And maybe, but I actually think this is part of his plot. See, I think, I think he knows what he's going to do, and I think one by one he's going to bring these people in, and he's going to start an innocent conversation with, hey, you know what, I'm trying to come up with a final reckoning of our account. Uh, heavy records right here. How much do you think you owe my master? I want to make sure that our records match. See, and oh, you know, oh, you thought it was this much? What if I thought it was only this much? And it gives him an innocent way to propose a scheme to them. That's what I think he's doing. How much do you owe my master? And the first guy says, 800 gallons of olive oil. I don't know if you guys cook with olive oil. I love olive oil. Do you buy it by the gallon? I mean, have you ever priced a gallon of olive oil? Do you know how 800, this is a tanker truck full of olive oil. And, and you know, I went online just like on Amazon to see, and, and I figure they probably are using what we would consider what we would call virgin olive oil, and I don't want to get into the grades, but this is probably, it's stuff that they haven't like pureed or cooked in order to get the oil out, but they probably press it more than once. So I'll just say this is probably virgin olive oil. That's 70 bucks a gallon right now. Now, suppose that you got a really good deal and you got it for 50. Mr. Olive Oil owes his master 40 grand, right? Or 40 large, as they said in Get Shorty, right? (laughs) He owes him 40 grand. So I want to make sure one debtor owes him that much. Where would you store 800 gallons of, of olive oil? So I want to make sure you understand, we're dealing with some big quantities here. And that's why I think it's likely that there's more than one debtor. Okay, so there's, there's our olive oil. And the manager told him, he said, 800 gallons, huh? Hey, take your bill, sit down quickly, and make it 400. And I want you to think about what's going on here. This will be the only record of the transaction, right? My master doesn't know the actual amount. Cut it in half, and he'll never know. And now, I've just saved you 20 grand. In a few days, I'll come up and I'll be asking you for a favor. Do you see the plan here? And part of what I want you to do is I want you to admire not the ethics of this plan. The ethics are in the toilet. Let's just admit that, right? I want you to admire that this is clever for a guy who's got about a few hours left to make arrangements for his future. Because in that culture, if I do that kind of favor for you, you are obliged to do that kind of favor for me. And you would want to. But even if you didn't want to, in your own hand, you've written this falsehood. We are now partners in crime, which means I know you and I are both involved in something bad and neither one of us wants it to get out. See, do you understand his scheme here and how it works? And, and that's, that's, I think, what he's doing. And this is, you know, if you've ever seen a movie like The Sting or Ocean's Eleven, or we, I even mentioned Get Shorty, what, if they tell the story right in these movies, these heist or these caper movies, you very quickly forget that everything everyone is doing is illegal. Right? They could all go to jail for all of it. But we have a sneaking admiration for the plot or the scheme that's being carried out. That's what's going on here. Okay? And that's what we're supposed to be thinking. We should almost hear Marvin Hamlish in the background playing Scott Joplin ragtime music. Okay? That's what we should hear. So he asked the second guy, how much do you owe? A thousand bushels of wheat. Um, He told him, take your bill and make it 800. Okay, now, by the way, the, the original quantity wasn't gallons. It was something they called baths, 
right? Like you would take a bath in olive oil, apparently. I don't know. But it was, it was, and the original quality here isn't, isn't, uh, isn't bushels, but they've converted it. But just so you know, a thousand, according to the Kansas wheat board, which I have a lot of faith in, right? A bushel of wheat is 60 pounds of wheat. This is 30 tons of wheat that he owes him. Do you, I mean, do you read through these things and you think, I wonder how much wheat that is? It's a truckload of wheat that he owes. And I don't know, the value of wheat actually now is probably a lot lower because of the farming techniques than it would have been back then. Now, this would be worth something on the order of $10,000. And our boy just made it eight. And he skimmed 2000 off the top and nobody ever knows. And I said, quick, take your bill and make it 800 Are you following this? I hope so, right? Uh, again, Jesus is not suggesting that we go out and do these unethical things. This guy's about to be commended, and that's shocking. But what he's commended for isn't his ethics. It's his smarts. Now, I, I, just real quick, some of you might have heard this before, and you might have heard it taught that what this guy was doing, what the manager was doing, was cutting the interest that was illegally being charged from one Jewish person to another. And, and so in that case, he was acting nobly. I don't think that works because Jesus calls him dishonest in the next verse. And we don't have any evidence coming out of Jesus' mouth that he, if Jesus wanted this man to be acting nobly, he would have told us that. And I don't think that's the case. Another theory that I read a lot this week is that he was cutting his own commissions back from these people. So it was a self-sacrificial thing on his part to ingratiate himself with the master's debtors. Well, you know, again, that doesn't work. We weren't told that, first of all. But second of all, since he's already wasted the resources, he's stealing from his manager anyway by doing that to gain favor with people. So I, I, I've heard those things. And I think sometimes people go through all kinds of hoops to try and make this a good guy. Because we don't want a bad guy to be commended. Well, he's not being commended for his sense of ethics. I can assure you that. He's being commended for his plan. And that's what happens. The shocking verse is the first half of verse 8, when the master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. He was commended not because of his integrity, but because, okay, that was clever. And it's almost as if the master said to him, you know, you're just as much of a rascal as I had heard you were, but that was smart. I will give you that. That's the way you should hear that verse. And by the way, it doesn't say, and so he hired him back. And it doesn't say that he avoided punishment. He just commended the plan. That was clever. And that's all we're left with. I hope that makes sense. So that really is the point. The second half of this verse, then Jesus now kind of speaks more broadly. He's brought the parable to the close. Jesus is speaking the whole time. He's brought the parable to a close, and now he says something interesting. He says, for the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are people of the light. And actually, I have more trouble with this part of this. Because, I, you know, when he says people of this world, he, he means non-Christians. And when he says people of the light, he means Christians. There's three verses in the New Testament that I found, and there's probably more where Christians are referred to as people of the light. So is he saying, is, wait a minute, this is a little offensive. Is Jesus saying that non-Christians are better at dealing with each other than we are? And you know what? I don't think that's what he's saying, but I do think that he thinks that they're better at handling worldly wealth than maybe we are. And I, I had to take a lot of time, and I had to fold my hands and put my legs up, and I actually fell asleep doing it once, thinking, just once, thinking to myself, is that true in the world? Is that really true? Have I seen other people make shrewder deals than Christians do? And I don't know. I, that may be true. I'll tell you something. Sometimes we as Christians uh, buy high and sell low on things which is not what we want to do, just in case you haven't figured out the mathematics of that expression. So this, this might be part of what Jesus is telling us. But what's really nice about this is verse 9, honestly, verse 9 clears this whole thing up. And that's, here's a good Bible study practice. When in doubt, keep reading sometimes. Because verse 9 tells us what this whole parable is about. 
There's no question that Jesus intended this to mean, I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves so that when it is gone, you'll be welcomed into eternal dwellings. That, this, and sometimes when I've taught this to 16-year-olds, to 10th graders, I start with this verse and we work back. Because this makes it really clear. Oh, the purpose of this has been for us to be as clever. Think of that from that lesser to the greater. This guy was a rotten egg, but he was pretty smart with the worldly resources at his disposal. Shouldn't we be at least as clever as children of the light in dealing with that? And I think that's the case. After all, worldly wealth that we're talking about, it is temporary, right? I mean, we don't, hopefully I don't have to argue that with you. Jesus says when it's gone, right? And it will be gone one day. And, I mean, <laughs> excuse me. Everything you're in charge of now, someone else will be in charge of in the future. Isn't that kind of interesting? You know, and that's sometimes a, a rotten thing to think about. But all it does is it reminds us that all of the assets that are in our... We're like this manager. Our, this is a temp job. And the resource we're in charge of, they all belong to God to begin with. And you might think, well, you know what? But I've worked hard and I've made good dealings in my life. And, and I, I think that's wonderful. And I think that... But, you know, God helped you do that even. David put this really well. The Bible affirms this, that all, all wealth really belongs to God. He's allowed you to, to earn it. He's helped you to earn it. He's pleased that you earn it. You don't have to hate it, but you're a steward of it for a little while. In 1 Chronicles 29, uh, the Jews had just donated enough money to build a temple rather than have to go in a tabernacle. And even though David was not going to be the one to build it, he gave praise in a fantastic prayer. In verses 10 through 13, you might, I want to read this whole thing to you. David praised the Lord in the presence of the whole assembly, saying, Praise be to you, O Lord, God of our father Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor for everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, O Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. Wealth and honor come from you. Hmm? Wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things. In your hands are strength and power to exalt and give strength to all. Now, our God, we give you thanks and praise your glorious name. That's a beautiful prayer, isn't it? But hidden within it is the cattle on a thousand hills, all the earth. It all belongs to God. We're in charge of it for a little while. Do you see yourself like this manager? Just, I mean, not, not to act rottenly, but do you see yourself a little bit like this manager? You're in charge of a really wealthy guy's resources, and he's given you some of them for a while. And when that stewardship is up, how have you accounted for them? How have you managed them? Right? Jesus spoke about money a lot. He did. More than a third of his parables and teachings were about money. And I think it's because it's just a symbol for everything that we are stewards of. I always learned it this way. There were three T's. Time, talent, and treasure. And those time, talent, and treasure, if you think about all the time and talent and treasure you've got, you get a pretty good category for accounting for all of the resources that God has given you. And, I, and, and that's, that's what we should be thinking about. Without recrimination, I mean, the past is past. I have been a poor manager of all three of those things at time. I really have. I've told you before, I'm a patient in the same hospital. I would be embarrassed to tell you how I've managed some of the, my time and talent and treasure in the past. But going forward, this parable is to remind me, maybe I could be a little better about that. As a matter of fact, maybe not just be a little bit better. There are probably some ways that I could project that currency into the future. You see, this currency is going away. This worldly wealth is. Maybe there's a way I can convert it to something that will be eternal. I want to close today, and we're going to talk more about this as chapter 16 goes on, 
But I want to close today. I want to talk to you a little bit about the life of Jim Elliott. Some of you know Jim Elliott and the name uh, you're nodding. If you don't, you might remember that Jim Elliott was a, a missionary that went down to, uh, to minister and try and bring the gospel to a tribe in Ecuador. And uh, he was killed by the very people he was trying to bring the gospel to. Uh, he was a Wheaton College graduate. He's an American missionary. He went down to Ecuador in the late 40s and early 50s. And um, a tragic misunderstanding, he was killed by a remote tribe of people that he was trying to bring the gospel to. His wife stayed behind after they killed her husband and continued to minister to that tribe successfully over many years. It makes a great story. One of the things that Jim Elliott is famous for was that he kept a journal. And maybe the most famous entry in his journal is from October 28, 1949. And he, he was speaking a lot about how he dedicating his work to Jesus was more important than his own life. And he cited this verse. He, he cited Luke 16, 9. I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves so that when it is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. And then he wrote the most famous quote from his diary. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. Isn't that interesting? If you're among Christian people, most of us know that and think of that as an amazing, amazing attribute, almost inspired. Well, it was, it was inspired by this very parable. And that's what I hope. Are you hoarding? Are you hoarding a currency that you can't keep? <laughs> that seems foolish to me. But I'll tell you what, we can pray today. We can ask God to inspire us with the brilliance that comes from him to allow us to convert that, that currency to a value that cannot be lost. Let's pray. Father in heaven, how grateful we are that you have made us children of the light. Uh, we thank you so much for giving so much to each of us. You, you truly have blessed us. And as we recount our blessings, we say thank you. So, Father, we ask that you inspire us with your creativity, the creativity that's in every butterfly and every blade of grass, so evidently brilliant creativity in the universe. Can you allow a drop of that to be poured out on us that would allow us to think in a special way how we could use the resources you've entrusted to us that would add value to your kingdom? And help us all, Father, without guilt from the past, to simply commit going forward to do the most with all the time and the talent and the treasure you've given us. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.